Welcome to the Everyday Mindfulness Show, where we educate and inspire people to live fuller lives through mindful practices. Let's get started with your host, New York Times contributor, leadership advisor, sought-after keynote speaker, the author of the Amazon hot new release, Everyday Mindfulness from Chaos to Calm in a Crazy World. She's smart, strong, sassy, and a trendsetter in the field of mindful leadership. Your host, Holly Duckworth. Welcome to the Everyday Mindfulness Show. And today we are talking with John Geese, the author of the 45-minute business breakthrough, how to find revenue in your business in 45 minutes or less. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Holly. Well, we're so grateful to have you on. You know, we're, we always uh, see each other at you know, NSA functions, and we, we don't often get to talk, and that's part of what's fun about the show is yes. we get to bring guests on, on the show to learn more about who they are, what they do, what they love, and uh, kind of explore what they think or don't think about, about mindfulness. And our messages really do align in terms of um, bringing heart and spirit and soul integrated into the business world. Right. Well, in fact, um, I can remember reading an article you used to write for the Science of Mind magazine like seven or eight years ago and going, oh, shucks, somebody's stolen my idea. Uh, well, I had the honor and privilege of having a column in the magazine for se several years on the intersection of, of leadership and, and spirituality. And, you know, I, I've often said to people, if I could just tell it like it is, I'd say I'm spirituality and business. But I tried that and it didn't work. No, um, they're not buying that. They don't want, we change people's consciousness, but that's not why they hire us. Well, and I, I think that this is where this, this word mindfulness has become kind of sexy and uh, relatable for people. So we'd like to start the show inviting every guest from all walks of life to talk about what does mindfulness mean to you? Gosh, it's a great question. It's, it's one that um, has gone through iterations. You know, there's a distinction between mindfulness and awareness, I think. And, you know, mindfulness is being present in the moment. It's, for me, it's giving my full attention to what I'm doing, it's also having all of the chatter that goes on with a mind that's full of stuff. Um, whereas awareness is that ability to step back and be aware of what's happening in the moment and maybe make an adjustment if need be. Like uh, you and I share um, the passion of speaking from the stage. When you're up there, you never know what's going to happen. And that's part of the fun of it because you don't know, you have to be really present and being aware of, oh, that person's frowning. Let me see if I can figure out how to undo that frown. Did that make sense? You know, that's the cool part about this show. And I think about mindfulness as a practice is there's a general frame of a definition, but not one agreed upon definition, which makes this work both interesting and, and challenging. So I've, I've heard a variety of, of perspectives on that and I'm always really careful to, to, to try to do my own best job to take the judgment out of it because I use uh, the definition. Mindfulness is the practice of being present in the moment with non-judgment. Uh, that's John Kabat-Zinn's definition. Oh, okay, yeah. And so, sometimes that non-judgment piece is the hard piece because we're hardwired for judgment. We are. Then it, it's, uh, if my ears start getting red, I realize that I have to take a step back. So how does mindfulness show up in your life and in your work? So a couple of ways. I have been practicing a process called the Miracle Morning for several years. I think it's Hal Elrod that came up with that. And it's every morning I get up and I do a little bit of inspirational reading or listening. I do some 10 minutes of quiet sitting. Oftentimes, there's a little voice in my head chattering away at me. Um, so just trying to breathe through that. And then, you know, kind of setting the intention for the day. Um, in my work, one of the things that, so I came out of a world where I wanted to be an expert, but I didn't want to be the expert in the law of the business. I wanted to be the expert in the way we communicate, because I think that's how we all connect with each other. And if you stop and listen to many conversations, they're really not conversations, they're dueling monologues. 
someone says something and someone tries to top something. So I climbed Mount Everest. So yeah, well, I climbed Mount Aconcagua and so on. It, and it's, but when you can really slow down and be present and be with someone and really connect, there's a whole host of influence and persuasion and worlds that open up that take away the friction from what we do in business. I, I love that. I had the opportunity um, to travel the last week and I was, was sitting out by the pool and I could hear a conversation happening in another language. <laughs> The, the demeanor of the, the energy, um, often we don't hear it in our native language, but it is, it is fun to sit in the experience and the energy of, of another language and then really reflect back on how does that impact our own, like you said, uh, correspondence with one another. Well, it was one of my very first blog posts that I wrote years ago, we were all out for dinner at one of those really wonderful restaurants tablecloths, candlelight, soft music. And I looked around and every single table had a blue flickering light with someone looking at their phone. These people were dropping like $100 a plate. The couple next to us was in their 30s and they never looked up from their phones the whole evening. And it just struck me that while this tool is a connector, it also disconnects us in a really fundamental way. I, I struggle that, with that a lot. People ask me, you know, oh, what, what's your favorite mindfulness app or tech app? And I think there is a place we, ha we can use the technology mindfully to connect us, like in the show. And then yep. we do have to be aware of how much we're using it or how we're using it. And I think there's a lot of data now around, you know, 30 minutes or 70 minutes or 50 minutes. And I don't think it's so much about the minutes. It's about how our energy is connecting to that, which we're connecting to on the other end mm -hmm. of the, the phone. Well, when we get together with people, you know, like you and I are connecting over a video. This is my second favorite best way. The best way is in person. But there's a, um, an energetic connection. And if we're not present, if we're looking at our phone or if we're thinking about the last meeting that we were in and we're not here, we feel that. And then, so uh, an example that I use often is remember the person you fell in love with. Remember how they leaned in and listened to everything that you said? Remember, can you feel that in your body? And now think about the guy or the gal that whips out their phone or they're always checking to see who's texting them in a conversation. You can feel that difference in your body. And what happens in so many organizations is we're running from meeting to meeting to meeting. We're, going, we're trying to multitask and do all of this stuff that we don't take the time to connect with the people in the room. And as a result, we end up with stress, strife, conflict, friction, different agendas, and it doesn't have to be that way. I, I have a slide in my, my keynote deck of a, of a robot sitting in the, the lotus, the, the mindfulness pose, and it, it, it is almost heartbreaking. I think that we, as, as AI and more technology integration happens, that we are almost building ourselves to be robots. Many of my friends have these iWatches and, and Apple phones and all, you know, and, and they want to be connected all the time. I, 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 you know, they, they need to know their beats per minute and their, their how many calories they've ingested and all this data and numbers. And I, I think there's a place for that, but it's also being mindful about just like you said, that energy thing that you feel when somebody walks in the room. I love your analogy of, of your, your lover or your significant other. We've also had the opposite of that in a business meeting when somebody walks in and you go, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, Debbie Downer walked in or Downer Don. It's just, it, it, you don't even have to see them. The energy, you can feel it. And we are communicating that all the time. And even without opening our mouths, we're communicating that. So how do we take that and apply that to our business in a way that allows us to open people up and make them more creative, more collaborative, more innovative. Well, in the show, we have a book that goes with it called The um, Everyday Mindfulness from Chaos to Calm in a Crazy World. And you used one of the words that we use in the book, which is that idea of setting your intention for the day. You said, you know, that your practice is about setting intention that, you know, I think we have to really think about what's that energy that we're bringing to our family, to our home, and recognize that that's what's coming back to us all the time too. 
Well, I, it's, I, I have worked for a long time in healthcare, and if you have any experience there, most executives have three meetings scheduled every hour of the day. And when you ask them which meeting do they go to, it's the one where the fire is burning the brightest. And I have a picture in my mind of Pigpen from the comic strip Peanuts, mm -hmm. where he was a little boy with the cloud of dust that followed him around. And so these people are running from meeting to meeting to meeting with this little cloud of dust from each subsequent meeting, building and building and building around them because they don't take the time to disconnect from one meeting to the next meeting so that they can come in and be fully here for this meeting. And it's sad because we lose so much when we don't take a moment to reflect on what we just gathered in this meeting and what do we really want to accomplish in this meeting. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So why don't we give our folks just a minute to digest these thoughts on mindfulness and we'll be back with the right. Mindfulness Show. The Everyday Mindfulness Show is brought to you by Leadership Solutions International. Are you hosting an upcoming conference or convention? Or looking for a speaker to provide inspiration and motivation? Would you like your audiences to know what you know as a listener of the Everyday Mindfulness Show? Check out Leadership Solutions International for more on mindful leadership keynote offerings, on-site mindfulness information centers, and trainings. Welcome back to the Everyday Mindfulness Show. Today, you've got Duckworth and Geese. We're talking about mindfulness. And John, I want to take the second segment of the show and dive a little deeper into your book, 45 Business Breakthroughs That You Can Find in 45 Minutes. Now, I know this book has a specific target audience, but I know that these lessons can be applied. If you're a CEO in a major Fortune 500 company, if you're running your own business, or maybe even in your family life. So tell us a little bit about some of these techniques that we can apply mindfully to be more profitable and productive in the world. Yeah, wait, so I'm really glad we're having this conversation because it helps me a little bit as well. When we think about our business, we think about the work that we do. So if I'm a painter, I paint homes, interior and exterior. If I'm a roofer, I roof. And we think that the customer is looking for someone to give them a roof or to paint their home. When really the customer's got another question in there. And that question is, will they show up on time? Will they be done on time? Will they make a mess of my home? So as a, an entrepreneur, when we can slow down and really get clear on how we solve the problems that our customers have, be it with painting, with roofing, with clothing, with a restaurant. What are we really trying to deliver to them? What experience do we want? And who are they? And Holly, you and I have both been speakers for a while. You can probably resonate with how hard it is to decide who your niche market is, who is your target market. And when we can get really clear on the people that we can best serve, and that really want what we deliver versus need what we deliver, there's a resonance. There's a, I don't want to get too woo, but there, people hear us in a different way. It's like a sonar that pings when they hear the message. And it's like, I want to know more about that. I'll give you an example. I met a young real estate agent not too long ago. She said, I sell real estate up and down the front range, commercial and residential. Great. So does everybody else. And then I met a young man that says, I help millennials find the loft of their dreams in downtown Denver. I'm not a millennial. I'm not looking for a loft. But if I hear that, I know exactly who to connect them to. And so for my customers, the big, one of the biggest challenges is to get people to slow down and block the time for themselves to really think about their business versus just be in their business. And I would complement that, John, with, with the notion of thinking about their business and feeling into their, their business, too. That there's a, an alchemy that happens with the thinking about, the, say, the systems in your business. 
I've got to, you know, create the blog podcast. I've got to post it on the website. I got to upload it to iTunes like that. Right. And then for me, I, I'm, I'll, I'll use the show as the example is that, that idea of how do I feel about doing that? Am I excited about the fact that this message gets to be resonated out into the world? And so the system, while it has a thinking element, it also has a feeling element also. Well, it does. And it, it, mm, depending on who I'm working with, I have to be careful about how to bring feeling in because some people don't want to talk about the feeling, but you can get them to mm, a really good example. One of my clients recently is talking about hiring someone and he's running an ad and he's got some people coming in for an interview. And I was like, I don't feel like I'm ready to hire anybody yet. And so we're exploring what does, where is that coming from? And how does he experience that to really get to, is that just the voice of fear or is there something deeper than that? So as we've talked over, over this conversation and others, we were talking about this idea of the data is in, in fact, I don't know if you've even seen it yet, but the, uh, this current edition of the National Geographic magazine cover Everyday Mindfulness. Mm. Now the data is in that mindfulness practices, however you label them, are making a difference in our personal and our professional lives. So I'd be curious, what, what data and research are you seeing, are you utilizing, and are you employing in the work that you do? Great question. So I am one of those folks that reads five or six books a month. I'm a consumer of podcasts. Um, what pops into my mind is, and this was a book that really changed my life. It's a book called Firms of Endearment. It's a good to great comparison of companies that are stakeholder oriented versus shareholder oriented. And the stakeholder companies outperform the shareholder by a factor of like 16x, both before and after the Great Recession. So the data holds up. And almost everybody that I talk to says, yeah, I get that, I love that. But here's what happens, we fall back into the inertia of our world. Um, I'm gonna geek out on you a little bit, but there's a test called the ultimatum game. I, I'm given $10 and I offer to split it with you. If you perceive the split to be fair, you'll accept it. And we both go home with our respective splits. So they took students from Yale and Stanford. These are demographically the same people, right? And they gave them the test. The only difference was in one scenario, they showed them pictures of corporations, boardrooms, limousines, on the other coffee shops, grocery stores, and neighborhoods. Boardrooms split the money 32% of the time. Nature, grocery stores, 91% of the time. The only difference is the idea that we have about what business is. And so really getting people to step back and become mindful of that business is about service. I think it was Khalil Gibran that said, love is work made visible. When we can tap into that and when we really get that, everything changes. Yeah, a few shows ago, I had the opportunity to interview a man named Kevin Rubel. And the whole show is on conscious capitalism. And I had, had done some, some work with him and, and this whole concept of you know what, what, what are we thinking about the circulation of goods and services within, is it Main Street or, we, or is it Wall Street? There, there has to be a reframe around that, especially in today's world where we've got, you know, the Amazon.com's getting bigger and yet we still have these beautiful, powerful um, gift shops and hair salons and things on, on Main Street that make our lives so vibrant and such a great cultural experience. Right. When Main Street goes, if you, so I spent several years working in rural America, traveling around, and when you go through a town that's been taken over and the small businesses are gone, there's a energy that's missing, a vibrancy that's missing from Main Street. And Main Street in those old small towns is, can be very fun when it's alive, but when everything's boarded up, not so much. So that brings me to a question we might have to rally together on. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure this even has an answer, but I, I think it's, it's a cool thing to explore with someone, which is this idea of uh, the integration of Main Street and Wall Street and how do we find that tipping point of head and heart. It came to me this idea of you know, now we have social influencers. I'm an Insta, Instagrammer or whatever. Like I, I never thought about them as like, person on the street that cut my hair or whatever the theme was, but 
it, it does take this new consciousness and willing to ask these different questions. And I, I'm not saying that that Instagram fan is the same, same, but maybe for some people that do live in this digital world, it, it is. And I think as a society, we have to start asking different questions and asking for different answers. Yeah. Um, I kind of, I heard that question as a, there's a whole community that's moving into a digital world versus a world on Main Street where we're interacting face to face and how do we change our interaction there so that we can continue to bring the empathy and the mindfulness and the heartness that we get when we're face to face online. Did I hear that right? Yeah, and I don't know if it's a how do we, it's do we, and, and why do, I mean, honestly, Don, I didn't really have a super question there, but I, I mean, like, just rallying with, with a like-minded person, yeah. it, it does invite us to say, if that's the way we're going, do we take these sort of pillars of society and turn them into online pillars of society? I don't, I don't know the answer. But no, I don't either, and it's, yeah. it's a fascinating question, because the research that I've seen so far is that as we, it's, then it goes back to where we are now. Like you and I are able to look at each other. We can see if someone has a question. There's, we can sense the energy. When we take this away and we see just a, an avatar or a photograph, we lose the empathetic connection with each other. And there's science around this. And so, and yet I have customers that I work with all over the world. And the best way to connect with them is online. I'm not, I don't want to fly to Europe every other week to meet with someone. So how do we make it as heartfelt and as connected as we can? I think tools like Zoom and Skype help. And I, I don't want to be a Luddite either. I don't want to be one of those guys that says, well, I'm not going on Instagram. Gosh darn it. There's nothing there because the world changes and I have to go with it. So I, there's my two cents. Well, and that's for me. I mean, I look at them as like almost different languages. Like I, I, I love, obviously we have a whole variety of languages. We can speak French, German, Italian, English, like all those languages. I almost look at the social languages this, the same way. And it's unfortunate, but if you choose to not speak Italian or choose to not speak Instagram, you just, there's a life experience that's different there right. and um, I think in, the, in a mindful world we, we get to pause and think about how those interactions work and you know we cannot do all the good that the world needs but the world needs all the good we can do as our friend Jana Stanfield says. I thought of that one but it, it's and, and our reach is extended through the digital right we can, instead of just sitting around the campfire, we can connect, you know, there are people that have millions that they influence. That's, you know, how do we, ta my goal is to inspire people to tap into that place inside of them where they want to use their power and their influence to create a world that's more sustainable and positive. And we do that by connecting with our hearts and making it, an intention. Absolutely. And that's where I, I'm so grateful that you're willing to come on the show and start talking about that bridge between the head and the heart, because the, the data is, is important in our business and the data is slowly pointing towards the power of the heart. And I, I hope you'll be willing to come back on the, on the show again, and we can talk more about uh, the soul and the heart. of. Oh business. yeah. This because is fun. It's really fascinating. So is there any other last minute uh, tips or ideas uh, that you would have people maybe try to bring their heart into their business? Yeah. So uh, we talked about the busy, busy executives going from yep. meet to meeting to meeting. One of the things I often counsel is, and I use it as I cross a threshold, like from a doorway to a doorway, is to just take a minute and take a breath and think, what is the outcome that I want coming up? How do I want the people in the room to feel as a result of my presence in the room? Who do I have to be? And I don't always get an answer and nobody always gets an answer, but with those three questions, there's a state change that allows them to step into the room and be more present, be more mindful and be more connected to the people that are there. 
who do I have to be? I think mindfulness is so much about the questions right now and honoring that we don't have the answers. And I, I thank you for letting me to explore a question with you on the show that, you know, we're going we're gonna to grow the answers in, in consciousness together as we continue to do this work. John, how do people get a copy of your book and how do people get a hold of you? So they can go to my website. I'm at johngeese.com. That's J-O-H-N-G-I-E-S.com. The book is available. Um, send me an email. It's self-published. Um, I, you can find me on Twitter at J.R. Geese, Facebook at JohnGeese.com. I think it's the real John Geese. Um, I had someone help me get the real John Geese out there, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. I like connecting with anybody. Wonderful. Well, thank you for saying yes to being on the show. Remember, mindful matters, and so do you. Thank you for joining us for today's show. For more mindfulness every day, visit everydaymindfulnessshow.com and download the three-day challenge and experience the ABCs of mindfulness. Mm-hmm.